welcome everybody and thank you if uh, you're joining again i i've lost track of how many we've done of these they began at the beginning of last year they're one of the great uh, i think uh, positive aspects of covid that we uh, have started doing these research spotlights and uh, it's obviously different to do this if we didn't have the sponsorship so we're particularly uh, grateful for Supernus Pharmaceuticals and Kiowa Kiran who support uh, these research spotlights and have done all of the ones we've done uh, at least this year so thank you very much and it's a great pleasure to have Simon Stott uh, which most people will call Simon Scott because that's the mistake everybody makes with Simon but it's uh, Simon Stott who uh, is joining us today to talk about drug repurposing and Simon has a very interesting path because uh, he comes from the other side of the world uh, and has done research in various laboratories around the world, including uh, uh, my own. Uh, uh, and I thought we would start, Simon, but but perhaps uh, just exploring that. I mean, where you began life, uh, uh, how you've ended up uh, where you are now. So so where were you born? Where were you educated? And how did you get into Parkinson's disease research at all? Uh, right. Well, Thank you, Roger and Eli and um, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, so I was born in the uh, the backwaters of uh, Third World New Zealand. Um, I was a country boy um, from uh, South Auckland. Grew up with uh, pet lambs and pet That's goats. New Zealand. New Zealand, yes. Yeah. And um, um, I went to university and coming out of university, I worked for a biotech company in um, Auckland. And the biotech company was called Neurons. We thought we were very cute because we had NZ on the end. Um, everyone across the road at Auckland Medical School called us morons and they thought they were cute because they had NZ on the end. But um, it was at uh, Neurons that I was really exposed to um, Parkinson's for the first time. Um, it was one of the indications that we were going after with some of the molecules we were developing. And um, I thought it was a really interesting, from an academic exercise standpoint, I thought it was a really interesting condition. And naively, I thought it was um, a solvable problem. Uh, you lose some dopamine neurons, so this is very straightforward. Um, 20 years later, uh, I'm less naive, but I'm still learning. Yeah. Um, but I appreciate now that it's a, a much more complicated condition. Yeah. Well, we might come on to that because obviously, you know, your the work you do with the cure Parkinson's and drug repurposing and clinical trials very much speaks to that. But I mean, so you're in Auckland working for this biotech company on, I'm going to call it neurons. So, uh, and then, uh, and then where did you go next? Did you go to Sweden next? Or I can't. Yeah, quite... yeah, yeah. So a good friend uh, Matt Mange um, visited Sweden um, um, looking for PhD opportunities, and he visited the labs of um, Anders Björklund and Lund. And Matthew kindly put a, I, I'm not sure what he said, but um, I had a phone call at one o'clock in the morning with Anders and he said, why don't you come over and um, pop over and have a look? Yeah. <laughs> and it was just a 27 hour. That's what does hour, from Auckland. <laughs> yeah, it's just a 27 hour flight, nothing to worry about. Um, but uh, we came to the agreement that I'd come over for a six month trial period. And um, if they liked me, I'd stay. If, they didn't like me, no questions asked, no problems. Um, and I got there, I just, I worked and worked and worked. We uh, did 14, 16 hour days and seven days a week. Um, but it was, I had the time of my life. Uh, and Anders Bjorken was the, is obviously, uh, for those who don't know, is the sort of founding father of brain repair. So he was the person 40 years ago who first discovered that if you transplant developing dopamine cells into the adult brain. This was in models, rat models, they survive. And that led to this whole idea of cell replacement for Pugsy. So is that is that what you were working on in Sweden? Uh, I was, we were doing lots of different things. I just tried to involve myself with everything that was going on and um, help out where I could. Um, I was more looking at um, gene therapy. So using engineered viruses to right. um, transfer um, DNA, excuse me. and um, well, to reduce growth factors, to promote growth of the dopamine systems or to make Basically, dopamine yeah. itself. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. This was just as GDNF was um, yeah. really exciting. And yeah. um, I was looking at it more from the developmental side than um, the actual therapeutic side. I was working with um, Dennis Couric. Um, he was my, my supervisor of the PhD. Yeah. Um, and I spent um, five, ooh, five years in Lund. And yeah. like I said, I absolutely loved it. It was an incredible place to be. And they, they set a very high standard, a very high bar. 
and um, it's just an amazing, amazing research yeah. uh, institute. And, and, and so from there, you obviously haven't stayed in the area of brain repair. Where did you go next? Because you say you talked a little bit there about development. So you were quite yeah, interested yeah. in how things develop as a way of understanding disease or was it? Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, uh, I, I figured it, I, I, my, my thinking was if you could understand, have a better understanding of the development of the dopamine system, you would yeah. have a much better chance of reconstructing it in a disease condition. Um, and so I went so the idea it. would be if you understood how it normally came about, you could then sort of recapitulate that in yeah. a disease state so you could regrow that pathway using the same principles that it came about in the first place. Yeah, if you understand that basic template, surely it can yeah. be applied to other condition, uh, other settings. Yeah. Um, and so I went to London after um, leaving uh, Lund. Um, Partly, it wasn't. It wasn't just a um, career decision. Uh, my wife, my wife to be, was over here in the UK. We had what was called a Ryanair relationship for two years, um, where every second weekend one of us was flying backwards and forwards. But um, coming over to um, England, I joined the lab of um, Sulan Ang, uh, who's a, a developmental biologist working in the dopamine um, system. Uh, development and um, I spent um, four years there and after that I um, came up to Cambridge and, and joined your good self yeah and how long were you here Simon I mean it seemed like forever but I mean it, it, I'm sure it was because <laughs> I think this was it, I mean I don't want to put words into your mouth but when you came here you were very much coming to work in the lab around aspects of disease, what causes disease, how we can better understand uh, the sort of biology of Parkinson's, if you like, without so much around therapies. But obviously you then have ended up in a slightly different area. So, I mean, I suppose it'd be useful just to hear with your time with us, obviously, you know, it's a bit tricky with me sitting here. I mean, how because you sort of transitioned a little bit really from the lab to the clinic during that period of time. So I'll, I'll be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, I came. I came to um, your lab thinking that I could apply some of this development um, developmental stuff um, back into the um, context of Parkinson's, because in Sulan's lab it was purely de of developmental biology, and um, what, uh, um, that was in your lab for um, I think three or four years, um, working away on, uh, on this kind of developmental angle. Um, and applying it to the context of Parkinson's. And then um, I started, see the beauty of your lab, Roger, and I'm not just saying this because you're sitting in front of me, but the beauty of your lab is that you've got the best of both worlds. You've got um, world-class preclinical um, situation with the wet labs and cell culture, et cetera, microscopes, everything you need. But then you've also got um, the clinical side. And I was always very intrigued with the clinical side. Um, and I always wanted to sort of get a bit of exposure to it because I'd been working on this condition we know as Parkinson's for uh, by then 15 odd years. And I'd never really sat down with somebody with Parkinson's. Yeah. And it just seemed like a wonderful opportunity to get some exposure to that. Um, and so I volunteered to help out um, in the in, in the clinic and that was i mean that was like a light bulb moment there, that really shifted the needle in different ways for me and um it, it just it opened it opened my eyes right and so i suppose it's interesting for people to know that that people who end up if you like doing clinical research or or thinking of clinical problems don't all have to come through a sort of strictly clinical background i mean they, they can't and you're a great example of people who can bring their scientific knowledge into the into the clinic and i think it was around this time you started your science of parkinson's website i think at, at some point yeah it's been I'm hugely sorry. successful uh, <laughs> thank you if you say so um i think it was about 2014 i just started i i've been dabbling with writing you know the great the next great uh, new zealand novel but um failing there has been one Sorry? There has been one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well. Um, but um, then I just started 
playing a bit with um, science writing. And then one day while um, working in the clinic, um, this, this individual walked in the door and it was Martin Taylor, um, who's familiar with a lot of the, um, to many members of the community. He um, set up the Facebook research interest group and um, he's become quite an advocate. But um, he'd come all the way from Edinburgh to take part in our research, and that sort of intrigued me. And um, he was just desperate for any sort of um, information about Parkinson's the re on the research side, excuse me. And the, the internet's full of lots of dark and dodgy places in terms of um, where you can find that information. Um, and so that's kind of where the science of Parkinson's yeah. sort of stemmed from. Uh, it's, I always feel like um, collecting stamps in public. It's a, it's a thing that I really enjoy doing, the writing, um, but it's a very public sort of hobby. Uh, um, but as long as somebody gets some value out of it, that's making yeah. me and Ben happy, then great. But um, <laughs> So you've sort of gone from a, a, a you know sort of basic science development, pretty hardcore science background development, really, into sort of applied development in Parkinson's. And then obviously public communication has been important or communication to the patient and publics about the condition. And then obviously from, from here, you then transition into the Cure Parkinson's Trust, which I think is now called Cures Parkinson's. I think it's it's lost the trust. Uh, not in that <laughs> sense, but uh, and and you've now become director of research. So so just tell us because we're going to come on and talk about drug repurposing in a minute for people who are worried that we're not going to get on to the topic. But I mean, when you arrived at Cure Parkinson's, um, what was it that excited you about Cure Parkinson's, and what did you see that you could usefully do there, which you couldn't do, say, in the lab here? Well, at the, uh, at the time, I was um, being offered a, a lectureship down on the south coast of um, the UK. And um, my wife said, no pressure, Simon, but they've got nice beaches down here. Um, and then Richard Wise, who was the director of research at the time at um, Cure Parkinson's, came out of left field and said, let's have a chat. Um, he liked what I was doing with the um, science of Parkinson's. And he said, um, you could apply a lot of what you're doing there to what we are doing at Cure Parkinson's. Um, and um, it, I, I just, figured my wife has forgiven me and she and she understands the um the motivation but i just saw it as a if i if i if i went with the academic position i'd be doing the same thing i've been doing just in a different location yeah whereas with cure parkinson's it just felt like there was a much larger um much larger potential and much bigger opportunity to do something um yeah. on a much bigger scale and, and, cure be, part, and be part of something yeah, and Kip Bugs, for those who don't know, was set up by the late Tom Isaacs, really, with which, and its name was there as a very clear call to cure Parkinson's. It was not about faffing around. It was let's just get on and cure it. And and obviously, uh, you know, one of the big remits of cure Parkinson's has been to do that by whatever route it can. One of which is drug repurposing, which is obviously an area you've taken off, taken on, and they have linked clinical trials and such like. So. I mean, I'm not sure how familiar people are with drug repurposing, but it might be useful to sort of talk about it. Because when you're trying to treat a condition, so let's say we're trying to cure Parkinson's, you can either say, well, let's use your approach from the past, study the pathways, find a problem, then see if we can find an area where we can try and target it, make a new therapy of some sort, and then try that and see if we can we can solve the problem of, of, the, of the condition. Or drug repurposing, if I've understood it correctly, is where you just take something that's already there and just chuck it in and see if it works but I, that may be a bit simplistic so so what is drug repurposing uh, drug repurposing is basically a, um, an effort in speeding up the drug development process it takes 10 um 10 to 15 years to get a, a drug to the clinic from basically from the bench to the, the clinic bed um and it involves a lot of safety and toxicology in the middle there and if you take a drug that's already being used in the clinic um that, that we already have a great deal of information about. We already know about the safety and toxicology. Um, you can skip over a large chunk of the developmental process. So you can have proof of principle that a drug works in a preclinical model um, and maybe some epidemiological data suggesting that there's something going on as well. 
and you can go straight into a phase two, basically a phase two clinical trial where you are. Which is, what, so what does that mean, a phase so two trial? Phase one is basically safety. Is okay. this drug going to kill anybody? No, right. good. Let's move to phase two. Um, phase one is very short, typically days, if not weeks. Yeah. And single dose, multiple dose. And that's often in, in people without the condition or is it normal yes, volunteers? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Usually you yeah. start off with um, healthy volunteers and mm. sometimes you'll include some in your cohort of interest. Yeah. But then you shift to phase two, which is more sort of focusing on your cohort of interest and doing a slightly longer study. Um, if you're looking at efficacy in terms of um, disease modification for Parkinson's, yeah. then you're looking at maybe 12 months of testing six yeah. to 12 months at least. And um, you're um, looking for, in phase two, you're looking for safety on a long-term scale in your cohort of interest, um, but also looking at biomarkers and um, measures of target engagement or um, if, if the yeah. drug is doing what it's supposed to do according to your theory. Yeah. And then you're also hopefully looking and seeing some um, signs of efficacy that will justify you moving to a much larger study, study okay. which is the big phase three study. And yeah. that's um, taking on hundreds of patients um, yeah. and multiple years of uh, evaluation. So, so the assumption is that, and I'll come back to it in a minute, to how you decide which, which drugs you're going to use, because obviously there's thousands of drugs out there that that, that are being used for all sorts of other things. But the idea is that you'd, you, for, for scientific reasons, you'd say this drug, I think, has a chance of working in Parkinson's for the following reasons. We know that you give it at this dose and it works. So let's just set up a trial where we have a, a group of people with Parkinson's. We'll give them the drug. And what we're really interested in is A, to check there's no funny side effects that occur just because we're using it in Parkinson's. But actually, is it safe? Is it well tolerated? And uh, are we seeing that it's doing anything that we think might be useful? Uh, but you're not at that stage trying to say, is this really curing Parkinson's? You're just saying, is it tolerated? And do we have some evidence that it might be doing something useful? So, and then that would lead on to these bigger studies, as you say. So I suppose first question is, is it, it, can you give us any examples where, where that's happened already in, in, in other conditions or, or in Parkinson's? Um, so drug repurposing has been used in a lot of different um, conditions and um, the best example and the example that everybody uses is viagra okay um it's not it's not re it's, it's more drug repositioning than repurposing because viagra start was a molecule that was in clinical testing for um hypertension so high oh, hypertension yeah hypertension oh, blood pressure trying to drop it yes yeah and um in phase one um the, the sort of the very first tests in, in man they found that had no effect, but they noticed this other thing happening. <laughs> and um, Pfizer- The story went that nobody would return any of the drugs if they were given it, was it? but I don't know. Yeah, something, <laughs> something like that, yes. But um, Pfizer, who were developing the drug, immediately decided to um, reposition it right. for um, erectile dysfunction. Um, okay. So that that's an example of um, drug repositioning or repurposing, if you yeah. like. In Parkinson's, a better example is uh, the drug called amantadine. Oh, yeah. um, so amantadine was um, being developed in the 1960s, and uh, it was originally an antiviral treatment um, yeah. against influenza. But uh, gradually over time, um, it became, um, th there were new strains of um, influenza that were, um, that could defeat the, uh, the treatment. So um, it, it was ineffective, but um, along the way, there were two doctors. There was um, Robert Schwab and um, David Pekasner, I think his name is. Um, and they had a, a lady with Parkinson's and she was, um, they put her on to amantadine to fight off uh, influenza um, infection. And she came back and she said, it was fantastic. All my Parkinson's symptoms disappeared. Um, and they all came back as soon as I came off the drug. Um, so um, they then did a clinical trial um, and a series of clinical trials, and they found that yes, this drug amantadine was having a wonderful effect. Um, it's a uh, it, it's a weak NMDA um, antagonist, and um, which increases so that's the levels, a, that's a certain type of receptor in the brain. Yeah, so yep. it, it increases um, levels of um, dopamine. Um, and blocks um, the reuptake of dopamine okay. uh, 
So that's how, that's how it's having its effect in uh, Parkinson's. Um, but that's a very good example of um, and that was and that was, that was serendipity, really. It wasn't. Being, it wasn't that oh, someone yeah. looked at it and said, "This drug looks like it could be helpful in Parkinson's." It was just given for one indication and, and then proved to be helpful for Parkinson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So much, but so much of medical history is just serendipity. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so I mean, I, I presume that you know the work you lead in, uh, about this isn't based on uh, serendipity. So, so when you're trying to decide on taking a drug that's already out there. And then using it for for seeing whether it helps in poxy. So if so, for example, there's you know there's been a trial that's finished fairly recently in the UK about simvastatin, so a statin for cholesterol. So so what? Why would people have thought that that using a cholesterol lowering drug would be a value in Parkinson's? I mean, you could sort of say, well, perhaps it lowers cholesterol, lowers your chances of stroke. So you know, perhaps it's good for the brain because you won't have strokes with Parkinson's. But I mean, my understanding was that there was more of a sort of rationale for why these drugs. Are you so it's be useful to hear because you obviously lead this whole initiative within cure boxes where you select the drugs that should be discussed for for clinical trials so how do you come to your decisions on this um it's probably it's probably wise to give a little bit of background on the um international and clinical trials program um before which is the big thing that you run with cure parkinson's yeah yeah but yeah. before digging into the sort of the, the meat of what we do yeah um so back in 2003 uh the nih um, in America, the National Institute of Health got a committee together and they called it a committee to identify neuroprotective agents for Parkinson's or um, synapse. Okay. And um, they produced a list of uh, molecules that they thought would be interesting to take forward into the clinic. And they published it and yeah, it, it, was, a, it was a wonderful effort, but there was no, no real sort of follow through. Um, and that's where um, Tom Isaacs and Richard Wise at Cure Parkinson's thought, um, let's um, be that driving so it was just, So basically, they just came um, up with a list saying, these are these are 20 very good candidates. There yeah. you are. We've looked at it. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we have given this, we've given these the, uh, the, 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 the vote of approval. And yeah. somebody, somebody picked the ball up and run with them. Yeah. And um, so can I just ask you all that, Simon, because we have a question about that. Obviously, you know, if I'm a company making a drug, for let's say simvastatin i want to use simvastatin to treat cholesterol i'm not i mean why would i why would i want to use it in parkinson's uh, you know so 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 how do we how do you persuade the company to do this or is this what cure parkinson's bypasses if you like uh i wouldn't say bypasses we are quite proactive in our approach um so with the link clinical trials program that was set up um 10 years ago and for yeah. the last decade we've been approaching um researchers and biotech companies saying you have this interesting bit of data or you have this interesting molecule um, focused around this particular biology that is associated with Parkinson's. Would you be interested in having a clinical trial um, in Parkinson's? And we look after the, the setting up of the trial and the, the funding of the trial and um, that side of it. Uh, for a small biotech company, it's quite an easy um, decision. Someone's come along and they've offered to do a clinical trial for us. Sure. Uh, all yeah. they have to do is supply drug and, and placebo. Um, that would be fantastic if they could. But um, and what? And can I just ask on that? So, if your trial was was successful, would the biotech company say thanks very much? We're taking it back in house now and going to develop it ourselves, or would would you have an agreement with them that, that it looks pretty good? We want to carry on developing this. Um, I'm just I'm trying to think about the legalities of our. Um, we do have contracts, but um, off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what okay. the agreement is. But um, typically, typically um, the biotech companies are all very keen, of course. Uh, well, not 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 always. Not always. Some of them. Yeah. Um, want the vote of approval from our international cl clinical um, trial committee to um, uh, to be able to go to the city and raise capital to um, develop the drug further. If a committee, international committee of experts in Parkinson's says that this is an interesting drug, then that makes it a very compelling case for um, raising money for a small biotech company. Uh, and but they want to do the trial themselves. They don't want anyone else interfering. Each situation is very different. Each situation is unique. 
and um, uh, it, it's it's always difficult to explain to people okay. um, exactly how the process works because uh, like I mean I can so, give so, you a, so it's on a case by case basis but the basic yeah. principle is you you go out looking for candidates some yes. of which are, are coming from academia some of which are coming from pharma or biotech yes. and then you start up a discussion with those people about whether we can take that forward into yep. a clinical trial and 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 what would be the evidence that you would want to know that that's that you're convinced that that's something that needs to be pursued in a clinical trial so if a researcher or a biotech company is interested um we draft a dossier uh, it's, a, it's a document that's about 20 pages long it's got all the information we can find about um, this particular um, molecule of interest uh this particular drug and we present that to our um, international link clinical trials committee um uh, at the annual meeting they meet once a year next this year's meeting is actually next week yeah but um we um they will debate and um discuss which of these there's usually 15 to 20 dossiers and they'll decide which should be prioritized for going forward into clinical trials and the top five are considered are considered prioritized when they rank them in scores okay. And um, once prioritized, cure Parkinson's is mandated to get them into clinical trial. And we do that with our funding partners, um, such as the Van Andel Institute, where the meetings are held. In the um, state? In the US, yes. Yeah. Um, and the very first molecule or drug that was um, prioritized by the ILCT committee, the International Clinical Trials Committee, was a diabetes drug called exenatide. Yeah. And we had, um, well, I wasn't part of the team then, but they had gone and they'd looked at the preclinical data and it, um, it was wonderful. So this is all the data you get from testing the drug in cells, in, in yep. rats and mice and such like, models of Parkinson's in the lab. Yeah. Yep. Um, and there had been a um, small pilot study in um, humans with, with in, in, Par in a Parkinson's cohort in humans, and this provided a very strong case for support for um, further testing of um, exenatide. And so exenatide was the very first agent that was prioritized by the ILCT committee. And then um, in 2017, we had the exenatide, the phase two um results come out which suggested it was doing something with regards to um the motor features of parkinson's there was a stabilization across the 48 week treatment period of the study um, of motor symptoms and folks taking once a week exenatide um and then that's led to a phase three clinical trial which is ongoing at the moment here in the uk yeah um but one of the so, so that yeah so that's an example of um sort of the process around one particular drug I suppose. and so would you regard that as quick because i mean if it's 10 years ago and we're still in a phase three study you know assuming that works let's say the data will be in two years time so it will yeah. be allowed in 10 to 15 years or close to 15 years from when the idea came about so so part of your remit was that you're trying to speed things up. And one of the questions we have here is it's, it's about a symptomatic therapy, I think, uh, as opposed, I don't know, AbbVie 951, but that I think it's a dopamine drug. So, I mean, I've got two questions for you. One is, do you think this really will speed up delivery? And secondly, what do you do about drugs which are better symptomatic therapy as opposed to disease modifying, whatever that means? Are you interested only in trying to slow down or stop the disease? Or are you interested in trying to find better symptomatic therapies? Um, at Cure Parkinson's, we're primarily focused on disease modification. So okay. if it's a symptomatic, if it's having a symptomatic effect, we'll leave that to um, okay. other, other parties. But um, the speeding always, up process, how you uh, can yeah. speed, do you think you really are speeding things up? Uh, well, so we're working to the classical model at the moment, um, but uh, which a clinical trial is a very difficult thing to design to set up because you um, need to be recruiting a large population of people. And so recruitment can take up to a year, 18 months in some big studies. And um, that's one or two people per week being um, yeah. recruited to the study. And then they're going to be treated for 12 months. Uh, I'm pulling a number out of the air there. But um, and so the treatment period can be a 12 to 24 month um, long period. And as a result, all of a sudden you're talking about a three year period of time. 
Um, for example, the Xenotide study is going to have its final results in um, early 2024. Um, and that started uh, basically in 2020, early 2020. So it's a four-year four study. Yeah. Track I mean, development. Kate messed it up a bit. So it is yeah. a, we have to give them the benefit of the doubt on that one. Yeah, but it's a very but drug development's a very very long and slow yeah. process, uh, yeah. particularly in a slow condition like um, Parkinson's, uh, in yeah. motor neuron disease and ALS, um, where the where the condition is so fast and so um, in, in, in its progression, yeah. you can uh, run a much faster clinical trial. But yeah. um, there are efforts to actually change the model and speed it up. For example, um, here in the UK, the, uh, there is a large project ongoing at the moment for Parkinson's called the Edmund J. Safra um, ACT PD um, yeah. project. This is uh, accelerating clinical trials for Parkinson's. And uh, this is a multi-arm, multi-stage clinical trial platform that's being built. So you'll have uh, multiple arms being tested, multiple drugs being tested yeah. on um, groups of people against a single placebo. Sorry, my finger's getting blurred out there. Yeah. Um, and that's the, that's the therapy that hasn't worked. So that arm disappears. That's, yes, what, that's yes. what you're illustrating. <laughs> so yeah, what, what, one, of, one, of these, one of these drugs um, might not work. And the beauty of the multi-arm, uh, multi-stage model is that you'll be analyzing the data as you go along and you can just stop that arm and let the others keep going. Yeah. Um, and that will hopefully speed up the process. Okay, so 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 I guess, uh, and we have someone here who's, who's running a massive drug repurposing platform in the uh, in Europe, which I'll come back to in a minute. But I, I just so I've, so just so we've got the basis. So you're so that what you're trying to do is speed up clinical development of disease modifying therapies by actually having a rigorous process by which to assess whether agents have a reasonable um, rationale for helping in Parkinson's. Yeah. Uh, and so you're developing out that side, and then obviously other people are trying to develop more streamlined trial designs so that you can run multiple trials or multiple drug candidates in one go to try and speed up uh the development without having to set up and take down trials every time a new drug comes along so one of the questions which is linked to that you've obviously talked about preclinical data but but jody's asked a question about uh, sort of epidemiology if you like so you know can you go looking at, at, at prescription records or yes. look at other diseases and say so for example um, these calcium antagonist drugs like uh, nimodipine, nifedipine, uh, uh, and all of these type of drugs which are used for, for blood pressure. If you look at people who take blood pressure tablets for, or take have high blood pressure, take those tablets, do so they have less incidence of Parkinson's? Well, it may be that if you've got high blood pressure, you have less chance of Parkinson's. So there, there may be other confounds. But is that something that people do? Do they look at the yes, epidemiology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you have to take epidemiological data with a grain of salt yeah. Um, for example, cigarettes smoking has always been a um, yeah uh, has always been associated with reduced risk of Parkinson's. But there was a study um, conducted called the Nicotine and Parkinson's Study or Nick PD Study, um, where they used patches nicotine patches on folks with Parkinson's, and they didn't see an effect. So maybe before diagnosis, it, it, a molecule will have an effect, but after diagnosis, it might not have any effect or it could have a negative effect. Um, but again, with the exenatide, this diabetes drug, um, they've looked at epidemiological data. This is Tom Fulton at UCL University yeah. here in um, London. He um, went and looked at um, individuals who have diabetes and were exposed to um, GLP-1 agonists. Um, Which are these they... type of diabetes drugs? Yes. So. Yeah. Did, did they um, have a reduced risk of developing Parkinson's over time? And he found that, yes, they did. Yeah. Um, so that's an example of the use of epidemiological data in this process. Okay. So the confidence you'd have in an agent, if you, in an ideal world, you'd like to have all this animal data, lab data, yep. sort of it all targets a pathway that you think makes sense would be involved in Parkinson's be lovely to have some epidemiological data, so data from community, how drugs are used to show uh, that that also supports it. And then you move into uh, a stage down, you're saying, so you don't go into phase one, you go into phase two study, which then facilitates stage three, phase three, and then we have this new networks which should facilitate trials. So it, it we don't normally have people ask questions or, or make comments directly, but I'm just gonna ask Harold if he's got a comment about this whole approach since Harold is running a 25 million uh, EU 
on drug repurposing in Parkinson's. Is that right, Harold, or is that in something else? But I don't know how I unmute you, if I'm honest. There he is. He's okay, unmuted. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I am a medical doctor and pharmacist at the University of Maastricht, and the EU is has um, um, issued two 25 million uh, euro programs uh, on drug repurposing. I'm coordinating one of them with 28 partners. Let me first make a couple of general comments with us. Is it, can I just ask, is it in Parkinson's disease? Of course not, no. Uh, that would be my first comment. Parkinson's disease is not a disease. Yeah. It so, is, so can I can I just uh, because we, we've got limited time, Harold. I just want to know what. No, what I mean, I think it's, it's very it's very important. I'm uh, quite frankly, and it's not uh, it's not a problem of Parkinson's disease. It's a problem of medicine in general. We are naming diseases after symptoms, or in the case of Parkinson and Alzheimer, after medical doctors. With these type of disease definitions, you will never ever find a cause, a mechanism, or a cure. So what we really need, and that's what we're doing in this program, um, we are redefining diseases by causal mechanisms, which yep. means Parkinson has several subtypes, which we need to take apart. And we do this by big data and epidemiological data. Yep. If you if you allow me, I can show you what. No, I think I think I, I've got your point. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back to Simon now because uh, we normally do this as a sort of interview. But I, your point is well taken because I'm actually going to come on to talk to Simon about stratifications of patients, which is something that cure. Yeah, actually, we are doing that. I can. I would be happy yeah. to explain yeah. that to you, yeah. and I would no, also be happy that's... to explain why uh, statin and calcium antagonists yeah. would. Well, thank you very much, Harold, for your comment. Uh, I'm going to go back to Simon now and and uh, pick up on that if we may. Uh, so Simon, in terms of uh, stratifying patients around mechanisms, because this is obviously, so someone's asked a question, for example, about ambroxol. So some people will know about ambroxol. Ambroxol is a drug which is a cough mixture, uh, and it's thought to work on a particular enzyme, uh, which is associated with Parkinson's, but maybe associated with a particular genetic form of it so so when you're setting up your trials you obviously decide on the candidates you decide what they're targeting do you then try and set up trials which are selected for particular types of the condition as harold was uh, sort of articulating or do you just use it generically in everybody with who's been labeled with that condition yeah so harold harold's point is uh, very well taken um the, move, the movement is to, away from parkinson's being some sort of singular entity and more towards uh, more personalized um, uh, approach to treatment, um, and we're we're doing that. I mean, we're still in the we're still in the very early stages yeah. of doing this. So, uh, with ambroxol, for example, it um, it raises levels of a particular enzyme that's associated with a um, genetic risk factor for Parkinson's, one of the most common. Um, which is um, occur, occur, the, these um, mutations, these genetic risk factors, the genetic variants yeah. <laughs> occur within a gene or a region of the DNA um, called GBA1. Right. And um, ambroxol has um, been found in preclinical models um, to raise um, levels of GBA1 and improve the waste disposal system of the cell. This is the role that this particular enzyme plays. It's involved with getting rid of all the waste inside the cell. So the, the, the idea is that by boosting the waste disposal system, you will um, help to make the cell healthier. Yeah. Uh, and this will give it a more of a fighting chance against the, um, whatever it's uh, fighting against. Um, and so what you can do in a clinical trial is test your drug against individuals who actually have that genetic variation. Yeah. They're, they're probably the best people to test it on to see if it actually works before you start looking in a broader cohort. So increasingly, the International and Clinical Trials Committee are looking at these sorts of trials. Um, how, can we, how can we bias our yeah. clinical trial? How can we stratify patients? Um, what biomarkers can we use at the start of the trial to say mm -hmm. this is the individual who should be exposed to this particular drug to, for us to be able to see if it's going to have an effect? 
Okay. Because, so, so, you, so you're not only identifying targets and, and marshalling the evidence for it, you're also saying, actually, if we're going to try this, whilst it may ultimately help everyone with Parkinson's, we think the best bet to begin with is this particular type of Parkinson's. So trying to stratify it around a particular, so personalise it to some extent. Yep. Um, and then and then I suppose one of the questions which arises, one of the questions we've had here is that's great. That's terrific. And we have this new trial design, multi-arm, multi-stage. But how do you know? How do you know it's disease modifying? How do you know it's not making people feel just a little bit better? And that's why it all looks very encouraging. How do you know that you're actually making a difference with the disease um, progression itself in some way? Yeah, so th this is the big challenge that we really face at the moment. Um, we uh, we have a large number of molecules of interest that have preclinical data suggesting that there's something going on um, with regards to their effect on biological pathways associated with Parkinson's. But the tools that we've got for actually measuring disease modification yeah. are still pretty basic. Um, we have clinical rating scales, we've got some rudimentary imaging um, uh, assays, brain imaging assays, um, and we, there's a, we're in a gold rush at the moment for biomarkers that will um, allow us to uh, better um, assess people over time and to be able to say, OK, this drug is actually having an effect. And, it, and is that something you do in the linked clinical trials or, or is it more about identification planning who, who who the best optimal group to try the drug in or are so, you also interested in in trying to sort of pull through if you like from the lab can we measure this in in somebody a change in this you know in this enzyme for example can we look at changes in the level of the enzyme so that we can actually uh show that if we think we're changing the activity of this enzyme we can at least measure it and show that we've made a difference in that we may not so, know if we've made a difference in the cells we're interested in but at least we have some measure in the person either in the blood or taking fluid off the back with the CSA? So the um, the International Link Clinical Tri Trials Committee, is um, their primary objective is drug selection. Right. They've got, they're, they're deciding on which um, drugs is number one, firstly safe, and number two, it has the best um, case for support. Um, and, but there they are a lot of clinicians on the committee. Uh, these folks are the best of the best. Uh, the, the chairman is um, David Simon at Harvard University. It was formerly Patrick Brundin at. Um, He's just put something time. in the chat, so you better say something nice about David. <laughs> He's a wonderful man. <laughs> um, and we appreciate the time and dedication that they um, put towards this um, effort. Um, but they're all, some of them are clinicians. And so the, you can, you're always having trouble keeping them focused on um, the actual. Yeah. Um, drug selection part because they will always get into a discussion about what the clinical trial could look like. We could do this, we could do that, we could do this. But um, um, yeah, so primarily it's a drug selection process, and um, the drug, uh, the, the trial design part comes afterwards. Okay. Uh, but a lot of community members like to be involved with that as well. Yeah. So, so I mean, you've obviously uh, we touched upon some of the hurdles with this. So it's obviously a great idea, but but what can you know, one of the problems is how do we measure what we're interested in? Um, so what other hurdles does it throw up? I suppose one that instantly comes to my mind is that, you know, if you give someone simvastatin, you might give 20 or 40 milligrams, for example, uh, because that's been shown to be the level at which you drop your cholesterol, your fat, the lipid levels in your blood. But there must be an assumption that that's the same dose that will have an effect on whatever pathway you think it's targeting in the brain, if it's on inflammation or something like that. So I could see that one of the hurdles would be to sort of guess that actually the drape, the, the dose we use for one indication is the same as yep. what we need for treating Parkinson. So, so have you got examples of, of, you know, some of the hurdles and some of the problems? Yeah, no, there's quite a few dosing is, is, is one particular um, hurdle um, formulation as well. Sometimes um, a drug needs to be reformulated in order to get into the brain better. So that um, means that if you give it in its current form, it will do whatever it needs to do in the in the body, but it won't actually get into your brain to do anything useful. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes, right. and, I, and, I, and you also have situations where you have possibly the right target, but the wrong drug. Okay. Um, an example of this is a, um, a clinical trial that was conducted involving a cancer drug called nilotinib. Yeah. Um, it goes after a protein called C-ABLE, which is quite hyperactive in many people with Parkinson's. And... 
um, the study showed that it didn't really get into the brain very well. So that's given rise to a series of biotech companies now taking up the mantle and developing um, new drugs, new similar drugs to um, nilotinib and taking those into clinical trial for Parkinson's. Um, where so I guess that makes an important point. If a trial fails, it doesn't mean it, it's failed because the whole idea is no. wrong. It may have failed just because simply uh, coming back to you know, Harris Point, we got the wrong type of patient, but also it, it may never have got to where it needed to get, which was in the brain. Yeah. Uh, an important part of any clinical trial should be a post-mortem of the trial itself. When a plane yeah. crashes um, somewhere in the world, a whole massive industry of people go and pick it apart and um, planes have been redesigned, cockpits have been redesigned uh, based on the findings of those um, efforts. And we should be doing, we should do the same thing with clinical trials. All too often we say, oh, it failed, let's move on. Yeah. But um, we should go in and actually dig out what potentially was the issue uh, or have a look at the data again and see if anybody did respond to a drug and uh, whether what was special about those individuals. Um, and there's quite a lot of that going on now. And, do you, and is that something you actively do at Cure Parkinson's or is it, or, or do you tend to leave it for, for others? So when you said, for example, if you did the Xenotide study and, and you, you fund that, you obviously then say it's something useful here, let's take it on. But suppose it hadn't done anything in the phase two study. Would you have then point said, okay, thanks very much. We'll go and find something else to do now. Or would you sort of go back and say, well, actually, if we look at it, there were five, 10% of the patients who did extremely well. What's, what's strange about them? Or, so it's just interesting to know, how much you learn from it and how much other people learn so from it. This is more the domain of my colleague, Richard Weiss. Okay. Um, he, he, he loves to go in and look at the data and look at who responded and who didn't respond and what was what was special about these individuals. And um, he now has collaborations going on around the world where they're looking at the genetics of some of the large clinical trials that didn't, um, that didn't show a positive effect on the whole group but there were individuals within the um, studies that um, did it did have the, the, some of these drugs did um, have an effect on. Yeah. Um, if they had an effect, that, that would still need to be proven. But what was it about these individuals that was different? Was there some a genetic variant, or um, yeah. were they? But based on a genetic variant, were they exposed to more drug, um, and that um, allowed the effect to occur? Um, but just back to your previous question, a lot, there are other hurdles as well uh, in terms of um, like patents. Uh, yeah. uh, intellectual property is an issue where there is no intellectual property on a molecule. Uh, it becomes a much harder task to get it into clinical trial because there's no stakeholder, there's no business model, there's no industry, industry support uh, for taking it forward. Um, and this becomes not so much an issue in the phase two part of the clinical trial process, but more in the latter part, because in order to get a, a drug approved with the regulators, you need to, there's a truckload of paperwork um, and a lot of regulatory um, details to be to feel, feel, be filled out. And it's a, it is an expensive process um, and you need industry support there. And if there is no um, intellectual property supporting it going forward, it, it it becomes more of a challenge. Okay, so so I mean, it can so so the hurdles are getting the right dose, making sure it gets to the right place, having a, a I suppose a business model really that actually if you get it past the first trial, it, someone's going to take it on and take it uh, somewhere else. Um, and anything else? I mean, I mean, if I mean, I, I don't know. Are companies sometimes obstructive in the sense that you know if 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 the drug is working and that it might sort of muddy the waters for them, or they'd be worried that if you did a trial and you got a negative result, it may impact on what they have the drug already in market for. So we have approached um, a number of pharmaceutical companies about drugs that they have in their stables um, and yeah. in, in, in sort of in their pantry about say, saying to them, this would potentially um, be very interesting to explore in Parkinson's. And when it's a clinical candidate, they, uh, they they will close the door in your face and they'll say, no, 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 we aren't going to, we're not going to jeopardize um, what we have going. We've spent hundreds of millions getting to this point with this okay. new drug in phase three. We're not going to risk somebody else coming along and messing it up. So yeah, that, there, there is that. Um, there so is that so we, we've sort of been hearing about all the hurdles and all the sort of caveats, if you like, trying to take it forward. I mean, obviously, the positive side is that more trials are happening. And, you know, one of the amazing things from the link clinical trials is that there was 
nothing in that space if you like before 2012 and now i don't know how many drugs you've taken through the trial and into clinical uh, through the through the panel into clinical trials but it must be at least half a dozen if not more than that uh, um, there's been 13 completed 13. clinical trials for uh, for of ilct prioritized molecules there's 13 ongoing trials at the moment and we've probably got half a dozen to 10 uh, or, you know, so half 30 a dozen new dozen. trials as a result of this initiative so so one of the benefits is obviously we've had 30 drugs trialed in the last decade uh, have there been any other benefits from it apart from i mean I, I suppose one of the things which i'm interested in is the extent to which who who, who attends your committees i mean you've obviously talked about clinicians being a bit irritating because they they just go off on tangents you've got the scientists who bring the ideas but you know uh, the the patient community the public and and do you get biotech involved do you get the companies involved so so who who are the stakeholders in your committee well firstly uh, i'm not going to let you put uh, words in my mouth uh, okay. i didn't call the clinicians irritating They're, they are um, intellectually curious and this the discussion is always very very stimulating it's always a wonderful okay. dynamic discussion um going on the committee member there's about 20 committee members in the room and um, then we have stakeholders or representatives from other stakeholders, such as the Michael J. Fox Foundation, Parkinson's UK, Parkinson's Foundation, um, uh, Shake It Up Australia, all, all, all of the um, other research uh, charities are, have representatives in the room. Then we have government representatives, NIH, NINDS, okay. um, regulatory representatives. And then we also have um, patient advocates present in the room as well and quite often the committee members will turn around this sort of sitting at a table at the front going backwards and forwards between themselves but they'll always be turning their um turning around to the rest of the audience and saying john or joe what do you think sarah okay. uh, and asking for um advice and quite often you see it's a very dynamic discussion and quite often you see the patient perspective shift the needle on um, on, on a drug um, so it's, it's really interesting from that standpoint. In terms of the benefits of the program, one of the unseen benefits um, is that it stimulates biotech companies to um, take an interest. Um, our job primarily as a research charity is to give proof of concept that yeah. um, GLP-1 agonists, exenatide, that there's something interesting here. And then you have biotech companies start up, like there's a biotech company called Neurally, and they've um, started up and they've designed a new version of um, exenatide specifically for Parkinson's, and they're taking it through clinical trials at the moment. And there's another a Korean company called Peptron, and they're doing the same thing. They've, they've taken their um, drug that they were developing, uh, an exenatide-like drug, and they've, they've shifted it to Parkinson's. So you're bringing interest uh, and investment and resources to Parkinson's. Um, so is that something you've seen over the decade that, that, that I mean, obviously there weren't at the beginning, but talking to Richard, that more people are approaching you now uh, as much as you're going out to try and get them involved? Um, yeah, uh, it, it, it was a struggle. Even four years ago when I sort of, when I joined the organisation, it was a bit of a struggle, but yeah. um, to sort of knock on doors and get interest. But now a lot of biotech companies, they can see the, the benefit of actually going through the process. Um, they, uh, to have a committee say that this is where this particular agent is weak with regards to Parkinson's, this is what they need to do. Um, but also get a letter of support from the committee saying, we think this particular drug is very interesting for Parkinson's. Biotech companies get a lot of number one feedback and number two, they get the endorsement. Um, so it, it's a really good process for biotech companies to go through. And we do have biotech companies coming to us now saying, you know, can we talk? Um, and so can, can I sort of, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So I just, I, I mean, someone's made the point, a uh, good point that levodopa, when it was first tried in the 1960s, I think there's a paper in Scandinavian Journal showing it didn't work at all, uh, caused major side effects and was ineffective. Uh, and that's because industrial doses were given causing peripheral side effects. And, you know, if you'd gone on the, the outcome of that trial, you wouldn't have levodopa now, which I think most people would say has been quite helpful. So, I, I mean, you know, it's an important point about learning from trials as, as, as we go along. And, it, and it's uh, terrific to hear all the work you've done. I suppose one of the questions which, which has come up is when we design trials, which isn't necessarily your brief, they're always quite short. And they're, you know, we have double blind, we have patients on one treatment, we have a placebo arm. And even with the multi-arm, multi-stage trial, 
often what we're looking at is we're trying to see disease modification over relatively short periods of time in a condition which progresses over a long period of time. So do you think we will move towards trials just running indefinitely and carrying on until we say, actually, there is we've run this trial for three or four years now, and really it's no different to, to if they if the people weren't taking it. So we'll stop it at this point rather than trying to cram it all into short periods of time. Is this something you see as the vision of where we will go with clinical trials? Yeah, so that's kind of one of the ideas behind the um, Evan J. Safra XPD um, multi-arm, multi-stage platform is to start a trial and just let it run and run and run from phase two directly into phase three. So there's no break between phase two and phase three. Just yeah. let it go all the way into phase three. As long as you see something happening, something happening, yeah. you have evidence of something happening um, in certain individuals. We, it could be just that five or six individuals in a particular group are having an effect. Uh, as long as we can identify using biomarkers, et cetera, those individuals, we can just let it keep going. And over time, it just becomes, that becomes standard of care. Yeah. And so for, for everybody that comes onto the um, MAMS platform next, that's just, that, that they're starting on that particular start point and being tested with new drugs. Ultimately, you're looking at combinations going forward. So if exenatide does have an effect, um, the next clinical trials will be exenatide plus something else. Yeah. Um, does that is that combination safe in people with Parkinson's, um, and which people with Parkinson's does that combination benefit? Um, I think yeah, that's that's kind of what we're looking at in the next five to five to ten years. Well, I mean, it's terrific, Simon. I mean, it, you know, it, it's amazing where the field's gone in the last decade. I mean, you've you know, Link Clinical Trials has provided all these trials. We had thirty-two trials, twelve completed, twelve ongoing, six planned. So, I mean, thirty trials. Can't even add up, uh, but I mean an enormous number of trials going on, which which wouldn't have happened without uh, you know the initiative you've set up. These new trial designs, we're hearing about stratification of patients. It's a very exciting time in moving things forward, and you know I want to congratulate you and Kia Parkinson's for everything you do in this, uh, for explaining it so clearly this afternoon, and also the um, way in which you brought all stakeholders in, which of course is very dear to the WPC. We we're very much about bringing all of the different stakeholders together to discuss how we can uh, solve the problem of curing this condition. So thank you very much, uh, Simon, for a, for a very uh, interesting afternoon of questions. Thank you, Harold, for your brief comment. And we may try and get you back at some point and discuss this uh, in more length. Um, I'd like to thank everyone today for joining us. That's uh, been terrific uh, questions we've been uh, receiving. I'd like to thank our sponsors again, Supernus Pharmaceuticals and Kiowa Kieran for making this series possible. I'd like to remind you of Barcelona next year, which I will do every hour until Barcelona next year, which is in uh, July. And to remind you that on November the 15th, uh, we have another one of these uh, uh, research spotlights when I'll be talking to Janelle Duran Ule, who also uh, has worked extensively in Pugs disease. And her big question is, Pugs disease is clearly associated with an age. So as we get older, we're more likely to get it. So how on earth can we model age in the lab and factor that in to try to understand what goes wrong in Parkinson's? So thank you all very much. I hope to uh, see you all again in November, uh, November the 15th, as well as July next year in Barcelona. So thank you all very much. And thank you, Simon, for a great afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you are. Bye-bye now.